All right. Again, welcome everybody to our uh, lecture this week uh, for our Sustainability Business and Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. It is my honor uh, to welcome <clears throat> Marisha Auerbach uh, to our series uh, this week. And I'm going to just give a, a little brief introduction of Marisha and her work, and then I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. Um, so Marisha Auerbach has taught over 50, count that, 5-0, um, permaculture design courses and sort of numerous advanced workshops in a diversity of topics. Uh, since 2004, she's worked in a diverse environments <clears throat> from uh, humid, excuse me, uh, temperate, uh, climate of her home in Washington State, um, to the tropical rainforest in Belize, to the arid landscapes of Colorado and Montana. Marisha was slash is, I, I'm going to say is a greener. Um, she received her BA from the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. She completed her permaculture design certificate with April Samson Kelly and Leisure Coast Permaculture Visions in Australia in 1998. Um, Marisha holds advanced certificates in key line design, working with cultural diversity and two third world permaculture design. She has also completed an advanced permaculture course with SEP Holzer. Marisha has offered permaculture consultancy services to, since 2008, and she currently teaches at the university level at Oregon State University, Portland Community College. Um, she developed the Certificate in Holistic Landscape Design at Bastyr University and was lead permaculture instructor for, instructor for this program for a number of years. Um, she currently teaches a permaculture design course annually at the Maya Mountain Research Farm in Belize in February, in addition to um, um, some wonderful, amazing things that she currently does as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you, Marisha. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tamsin. That was a great introduction to where we'll be going. I think, I think I've actually taught over 100 permaculture courses now. I decided to stop counting when I passed my mentor, Michael Polarski. Um, so we'll get some pictures of that. I'm just going to jump right in here. So it was an interesting uh, jaunt through the Wayback Machine to bring together the um, presentation that I'm gonna share with you today. And I wanted to start with, um, uh, with honoring my ancestors. Um, my grandparents are in this picture on the left. Um, that's my aunt who's the young girl and my dad is a little baby. And um, they're in the displaced people's camps. They had survived the Holocaust. They were deported to Siberia. And um, we're city people. Well, my grandfather spent some time, um, he was living in the country before he moved to the city. And he was a good businessman. He was mostly really savvy with um, people and interacting with other people and um, being able to see what people needed and be able to provide those things for him and for provide those things for other people. So um, their life was pretty shaken up um, in 1937. And when they uh, decided to flee their home, and I learned a lot of lessons from having the benefit of growing up with them. I thought a lot about scapegoating, and I'm quite concerned about the state of the world right now, as I see an increased rise of scapegoating. And I also learned about life skills from them, because they were very resilient people. And so I think that most of my, um, my career is actually a dedication to them. And then uh, the picture on the right is me in a Camas Meadow. And so I want to give great thanks for being a resident on this land here in Cascadia. And uh, I think it is when we become rooted in our place and we're dancing with the wheel of the year and the seasons that we can truly be sustainable and be able to care for the place we live. So the big question that came up for me as I was growing up and watching um, development happen and reflecting on the experience of my ancestors was how do we meet our needs without depleting our resource base? As population is increasing and consumption increases, you know, I think that it's really important that we look at, you know, what are we consuming and how can we be producers? Um, so this is my backyard uh, where I used to live in Portland, Oregon. And from this picture, there's numerous perennial vegetables, annual vegetables. We had about 22 fruit trees on this city lot. I was growing most of my medicine. And as you'll see, as I evolve my story, um, a lot of um, 
I had businesses off of here and we were feeding ourselves off this 6,000 square foot lot. But first I wanna introduce you to the permaculture concept. I learned what permaculture was when I was at Evergreen in 1997 as a student in the ecological agriculture program. I uh, did a paper on permaculture and I don't, I don't even know if I finished the paper. I think I just decided that I was gonna devote the rest of my life to permaculture design. And so permaculture design is a design science. So it's based in observation and getting to know a place. And we consider the context of that place so that we can meet the needs of the people on the site while also restoring ecological functions and caring for the earth. In permaculture, we're guided by our native ecology. It's important to come home to where we live and design our built environments for the stewardship of our resources and consider the habitat for all the other beings that share this home with us. Permaculture design begins with a thoughtful site analysis. So we spend, at least it's, it's good to spend as much time as you can in observing a place. Uh, Bill Mollison would say that you wanna observe for a year. Um, some things don't need as much time, but we're looking at the unique climatic considerations, what resources we have available, what our limiting factors might be, what those challenges might be, and then how are we gonna be able to meet our needs locally? So permaculture design strives to reduce our ecological footprint by meeting our needs locally, using our local resources. And then we also recognize that while doing this, while making our footprint centralized to where we live, then we're caring for other species, our neighboring communities, and the global community. So this is Bill Mollison, who's credited with founding the permaculture concept. And he was a researcher in Australia, and he was um, connected with many different groups of indigenous people. And he didn't he didn't create permaculture. What he basically did was he had studied indigenous people all over the world and was looking at what does it take for us to power down, to live a more uh, light life on the, on the environment? And um, what are the strategies that different communities have had in place so that they have a high ecological ethic? Permaculture is seen as a gardening system often, but it's so much more than a gardening system. We used to say permaculture was a combination of the words permanent and culture, um, or permanent agriculture originally, but it is a combination of the terms permanent and culture. And it's this quest for how do we live our lives in a good way where we're doing no harm and where we're actually creating um, resilient resources for the future. So when Mollison founded the term permaculture, when he developed this term, he was working with another researcher named David Holmgren. And they were looking at the um, peak oil situation in the 70s. And they were wondering, how do we have a conversation where we can talk to people with diverse points of view and um, found a fun, find a foundation where we all can agree? And so permaculture began with this ethical foundation. The three ethics of permaculture are care of the earth, care of people, and to share the surplus. So when we talk about caring for the earth, we're looking at conservation and restoration of the earth systems. We're looking at investing in the land where we live so it's not depleted. And with care of the people, we're looking at protecting human rights everywhere. How can we take care of the others around us and the others in the global community? And then we can invest all surplus to those ends, which is why we've got those two arrows pointing back up from share the surplus to care of the people and care of the earth. And so we're, we've got this feedback loop where we're taking care of our place and the people. But when I look at the consumerist society that we live in right now, I often think how people are making money by destroying wealth. So Mollison would say, all money arises from the wealth of the natural world plants, clean water, clean air, stored energy, and the accumulation of unused wealth or wealth does not, that does not lead to the proliferation of life is a pollution of the same nature as any other unused resource. So he would say manure and money have a lot in common. And this, a lot of his teachings were the foundation as well for me developing my career. I wanted to be able to um, have a career where I was investing in place and it was regenerative. So in the permaculture teachings, we look at different types of investments. And that's what, um, this is Andrew Millison, who's my teaching partner at Oregon State University. And this is what he's showing on this slide. 
Mollison said in his permaculture textbook, the designer's manual, we need to develop conserver societies with this conservation achieved by close attention to recycling, the avoidance of waste and to very durable technologies so that their use is prolonged. It is only when others feel secure that we need not guard our environments so that the very best preparation for security is to teach others the strategies, ethics, and practical management and to extend aid and education wherever possible. So we talk about different types of investments. What, what are degenerative investments? Maybe that's something we do with our money or maybe it's with our time. Um, also, then we have generative investments. And Andy's got a picture here of a corn crop. That's where you plant something by seed, you get a crop out of it, and you can save seed for next year. But then we can also look at regenerative investments. Regenerative investments are things that produce exponentially, that build over time. And there's a picture of an apple tree with a child swinging in it. When you plant an apple tree, you get so much more than just one year of an investment. And I think this is how we need to be looking at the future and how do we you know, regenerate the earth, regenerate our food system, regenerate our local economy. This is one of my heroes. This is Wangari Mathai. She's the founder of the Green Belt Movement and she won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work with women in Kenya. She mobilized women to plant trees all throughout Kenya and the trees had ecological functions as well as yields for their communities. So while she was enhancing the environment, she was also increasing food security as well as creating opportunities for right livelihood for these people. And so she would say it's time for an ecological imperative. All of our decisions that we do now, we need to base those in ecology, which is the relationship of our place. When Gary Mathai says, we have a responsibility to protect the rights of generations of all species that cannot speak for themselves today. The global challenge of climate change requires that we ask no less of our leaders or of ourselves. And I think this is something we need to look at every day. So now I'm going to take you on a bit of my journey, how I went from being a student at Evergreen, graduating to where I built my career in this way. And so when I graduated from Evergreen, I did my first, um, I did an internship here at the Wild Time Farm in Oakville, Washington, Chehalis River Valley. And after I graduated from Evergreen, I came back as the caretaker. So that was super fun. I had uh, 150 acres that I was farming, working on. It's probably only about three acres under cultivation. We had pasture, we had 100 acres of forest. Um, we had animals. I raised uh, chickens, ducks, guinea hens, peacocks, cows, pigs, and we had a goat. We had some goats. That's John Henriksen from the farm in the picture on the right. He was one, He's one of my mentors. And then Kirk Hansen's in the back. Um, sitting down in the field. And so I got to, you know, wake up in the morning and be able to go and pull weeds in the strawberry patch on my budget. And um, I was also able to select these agroforestry species to be able to plant at wild time. And it's been a pleasure now almost 25 years later to be able to still go back and harvest these trees and be able to reap the benefits of these regenerative investments at that time. Uh, after some time, I decided that I wanted to move off the farm and be able to see if I could do this on my own um, in a replicable model. And so I got this rental house in the Delphi Valley, Southwest Olympia, and I started turning the lawn into a garden. That picture on the bottom left is working with some interns. I worked with interns while I went while I worked at Wild Time Farm as well, and I taught my first permaculture course at Wild Time. And then I, when I moved back to Olympia. I continue to take interns. My friends would call this place the lawn at Sean because the Sean, the lawn didn't last very long at this place. And eventually it was a thriving garden. And while I was living there, I decided that I was gonna um, stop going into the refrigerator to look for food, but instead I was gonna trust that I had what I needed out in the garden. And so I'd go out and I'd look around and I'd always find something good to eat. So I, the refrigerator at that point became the almost compost because I much rather would eat the things that were growing in the garden. And so I did a number of workshops. I was just, you know, hanging up flyers and seeing if people would show up. Uh, cool season gardening was one. I did some seed saving workshops. I did some uh, mushroom um, inoculation workshops with my friends at Fungi Perfecti. 
And I had a number of different businesses that I developed off that space. I was trying to just avoid working in a cubicle, avoid investing my energy in something that wasn't meaningful for me. I wanted to develop a meaningful life for my future. And one of the things I started with was edible flowers. I thought, wow, flowers are a regenerative investment. The more you pick, the more you get. Um, it's just one of those things. You stimulate the growth of the plant when you pick the flowers. And so I sold those at numerous restaurants all over Olympia and got into um, other gourmet specialty food items. The picture on the left is one of the printouts I'd give the restaurants so they'd know what flowers they were getting that year, that that week. Um, on the bottom right, um, crystallizing flowers, where I'd paint them with egg white and dip them in sugar. And that was a high value item that people put on cakes. And then in the picture on the top, I'm teaching a um, edible flower cooking class at Bayview Thriftway. And then I also developed a line of flower remedies. These are the queen bee flower and gem essences. I had about um, 46 flower essences and 28 gemstone remedies. I also had other herbal products. There's some massage oil that I was making on the top of that case. And I just started, you know, trying to make what I could out of what I was growing. It was pretty fun. I also sold some books on the side. I was developing my permaculture teaching career a little bit more. And then a partnership with my good friend, Alexis Sarah, was uh, creating these greeting cards. So as a seed saver, I always liked those greeting cards that you could find in the stores where you could plant the card and it would grow a garden. So we decided to start doing that locally here in Olympia. And while we were doing that, we also started working with a collective store, Sylvan Wisdom. It was on 4th Avenue and we were selling local stuff made by local people to meet local needs. So going beyond just like what I could create out of my garden, we we're also connecting with other people that were interested in local economics and trying to bring strength to the people who were producing in our bioregion. In 2005, it was my first time that I traveled for a workshop. I uh, had done a permaculture course at Lost Valley Education Center, and one of the students wanted me to come out to Washington, D.C. to do a weekend workshop. This was at Bread for the City, so this lot where the garden is is right next door to the food bank, so we were addressing um, low food security by having a workshop for growing food and sharing seeds. And so since 2004, I've taught numerous permaculture courses. I really love the two-week intensive model of the permaculture course. That's what I've done a lot of. And we had students come together at an education center. We do the um, intensive course. Uh, for those of you who may not know, a permaculture design course is a specific curriculum. It requires um, 72 hours of mandatory instruction. And then we have um, hands-on projects that go along with it. And the um, curriculum for the permaculture design course was laid out by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren in um, the early 80s. And it's an internationally recognized curriculum. And we give out an international certificate that says that people completed this curriculum. Um, in order to complete the curriculum, students also have to develop and present a design project. And that's what you can see in the pictures on the right. So often we've got people living at a retreat center in the woods for two weeks. They come together from many places around the country or even around the world. And they have this intensive crash course in permaculture design, sustainable living and regenerative design. So I did that at Lost Valley for many years. That was in Dexter, Oregon. I did it at Sahali Retreat Center in Tahuya, Washington, our eco village on Vancouver Island and numerous other places. Um, some of my mentors that are dear to me that I worked with uh, in the picture on the left, there's Jude Hobbs and Rick Valley. Um, I worked with Michael Skeeter Pilarski. I worked with Brandy Gallagher and um, Brandon Bauer. And so I've had been really fortunate to have a wonderful team of mentors that guided me through this. Um, but yet there wasn't much of a roadmap of how to develop a career in permaculture. And so we've been working on um, sharing that more with our students um, as we do as we do these days. Uh, so I started um, being more connected in the permaculture world. And so I started bringing in people from other places to provide presentations in our community. It was wonderful in 2005 to meet David Holmgren when I brought him to the Eagles Hall um, and he gave a presentation there. And Dave Jackie, who's also a friend who wrote Edible Forest Gardens, came to Olympia in around 2005. And from my time at that place, the lawn at Sean, also known as Marisha's uh, Queen Bee's Permaculture Garden, 
Um, I one day went in the Black Lake Organic, uh, talked to Gary there and told him that I was growing most of my own food on this property. And he said, well, if you're doing that, then you should probably make a presentation and take that around places and call it how to grow all your own produce in two and a half years. It was about two and a half years that passed since I established the garden when I started just eating what I was growing. And so since that time, 2005, I've mostly just been eating food that I've grown and that's how I've designed my diet so that I'm in sync with the seasons and that's the food that I want to eat in the year. And I have a sense of how much is needed to be able to support myself. Around that same time, I met Mark Lakeman, who's the founder of City Re the City Repair Project in Portland. And he's been a dear friend and mentor for many, many years. I would go down to the Village Building Convergence in Portland, which was 10 days of natural building and permaculture. If you've been to Portland and you've seen our painted intersections or the, um, or the um, free libraries, those are all things that came out of the City Repair Project. The mission of the City Repair Project is to transform spaces into places, is to restore the community fabric of the crossroads in our daily life. And so that's why we focus on intersections, but we also do gardens and we do benches that are um, good installations for people to connect with. And then with Mark, we've I've done a tour down to California, the Urban Alchemy Tour, forgot what year that was in. And then we also um, did this workshop in Cleveland where we brought the village building convergence to Cleveland and we had three projects in Cleveland. Um, I'm, coincidentally, I'm also from Cleveland. So it was really wonderful to bring my work back there. In 2005, my dear friend Willow Witten uh, was thinking of traveling internationally and she had the idea to go to Belize. And I didn't really know what a wonderful synchronistic thing this was going to be. I met um, the man on the right, that's Christopher Nesbitt from the Maya Mountain Research Farm. And I also went and stayed at the Belize Agroforestry Research Farm, which is the picture on the top left. I learned a lot about um, tropical agriculture. And I've been working with the Maya people and the Garifuna people ever since. So it's always a pleasure to work with the indigenous people of an area. And I've been so fortunate to do that um, throughout my career. Now, this picture of Chris on the right, this is how we get to the farm. So that's a dugout canoe made from a guanacaste tree. And it's he's pulling it. He's called to pull Dory. The um, canoe is called a Dory. And he stands in the back and he moves it with a pole. And the, and the location is not accessible by car. We get there by boat. And that's been really interesting to be in a community that travels in this way. I moved to Fertile Ground Community Center shortly after that, and I've been working with Karen and Gail at Fertile Ground um, pretty much since 2005. I hope many of you know of Fertile Ground. That's the picture of the place on 9th Avenue in downtown Olympia, right behind the library. And Fertile Ground has been a hub for so many different things, for workshops, for different neighborhood organizations coming together. So many people have met at Fertile Ground and shared meals. And the mission of Fertile Ground has been all about resiliency and sustainability by creating community and sharing resources. The picture on the bottom left is showing an initiative that Gail did on disaster preparedness. And um, that relaxing picture in the bottom right is showing me with two really dear friends from um, this project at this time and onward, um, Joseph Becker and Chris Van Allen. So when I moved to Fertile Ground in around 2006, um, I was the education coordinator and the garden coordinator. And so we had a weekend permaculture design course. That was the first one that was weekends that I did. And so that meant that we had a Friday night presentation that was open to the public. And then the class got together on Saturday and Sunday. So you can see with that, uh, the flyer on the left, all the different topics that fall into permaculture design. We talk about agroforestry, edible landscaping, natural building, um, forestry, ethnobotany, nutrient cycling, appropriate technology, organic gardening, restoration, pest control, so many topics go into the permaculture design course curriculum. And we also offered at Fertile Ground this um, weekly workshop on just uh, sharing about our local area and why it's important to be local. We ate local food and it was a collaboration with Susie Kyle and Karen and Gail at Fertile Ground. Here's some other workshops we offered at Fertile Ground, seed saving, um, disaster preparedness, putting up the harvest. That was a whole day on um, food preservation and then also gray water design. 
And towards the end, um, when I, I was just about to move out of fertile ground when I went to Vietnam, and that was a wonderful gift in my life. Um, I went with Ruth Moss, who lives in Olympia. She's the, the first one born in this country and her family. Um, so she comes from many, many people that um, live in Vietnam. And um, so we went there to see her family over Chinese New Year. And afterwards, I went out to the Hatin province and was very fortunate to work with um, the these Hill Tribe students. Um, they, the picture on the left shows us with uh, the big tree. Every day we would go out and worship the big tree or we'd go out to the waterfall. And it was a very um, spiritual and connected life that they had. While I was there, they wanted me to teach. And I didn't really think that was necessarily appropriate because I hadn't been in their country for very long and I had so much to learn from them. Um, but I thought it also wasn't appropriate for me to deny the request of my host. So I hoped that because they didn't speak English, that if I said anything that was inappropriate, that someone would cut me off and put me in my place. So um, in the picture on the bottom left, they would present different designs every day, their permaculture designs. And then that's me and um, Tukian, um, one of their teachers, and we would talk about their design. Um, I think it's really neat how it's in Vietnamese, but uh, you can still see and understand what's going on in the base map. And um, they had gardens like the one on the right. This was at a farmer field school that was far from their homes where they came to learn. And while they were growing some things in rows, I found that working with people in other countries, I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to bring strength to their traditions. And it was really interesting how when we started talking about polycultures, which is um, the opposite of monoculture. So polyculture is when you have a lot of different plants that are growing together. Um, some of these Hmong students would get so excited and tell me about their grandparents' gardens and the different trees and shrubs that they had in relationship and how the ecology was working in these gardens. So I came home and I decided I needed to get some more skills on working in other cultures. Um, but while I was waiting for that uh, teaching, uh, that um, learning opportunity, I brought in Sepp Holzer from Austria. Um, he came to the Pacific Northwest and then I did a permaculture workshop with him in Montana. And my nursery was continuing to grow. I had my nursery for sale at Fertile Ground. I guess I haven't mentioned the nursery yet. Um, that began when I was at Wild Time Farm in around 2000, or actually in 1998, when Kirk Hansen told me, well, what you do is you pot up the things that come up in the pathway, and then you sell them at the farmer's market. So I started dividing my plants and putting them in pots, and that's been my nursery model ever since. Um, so we had it for sale at Fertile Ground, and then the nursery moved back to Wild Time Farm when I moved there in 2009, and then we'll get to the current uh, trajectory of the nursery. So I was back living at Wild Time Farm and teaching a lot of permaculture courses from there. So the picture on the right is one I did in um, the arid region of Colorado. Um, I did other courses at um, Tryon Farm in um, Portland, and I actually taught at the Maharishi University in Iowa. We had about 100 students in four different classes. And then I did um, advanced trainings, as Tamsin mentioned in the beginning, in um, key line design, working in other countries, and working in other cultures. And I was really grateful to find those classes being offered since it was so unsettling to, to be asked to teach while I was in Vietnam. I also got some good press. So that's uh, an article from the Chronicle in Centralia. I made the marquee at Yardbirds. <laughs> And then in uh, 2009, the earthquake hit Haiti. And a good friend um, who I knew from Olympia um, was call doing call out for people to come out to Limbe, Haiti, which was in the north, um, to help with permaculture projects um, to help strengthen um, the local agricultural systems there. And so I went and my good friend and colleague, Kelda Miller came with me and we had a number of other friends that came along. And so these pictures, the two pictures on the, um, the one on the right and the one on the bottom are showing us working with the agricultural association there. And the picture on the top left is uh, all the people that came by to show me how I should actually do my laundry where um, they really know how to do hand washing well in Haiti. And uh, apparently us Americans didn't really know that at all. And then back stateside, I was involved with uh, Sherry Trinka and Artful Life. So I mentioned earlier that we had that local store, Sylvan Wisdom, um, that was downtown that closed after a number of years. And shortly after that, 
um, Sherry moved to Olympia and opened The Artful Life. And we were selling lots of different handmade things um, by local people using local resources to meet local needs. And that was a beautiful community gathering place. We shared lots of food there. Uh, we contributed the flower garden to the procession of the species. And my products were sold there, which were the flower essences and tinctures and herbal pillows. And, um, and then I'd often have workshops there. And um, it was great to be involved with Sherry Trinka. I continued offering other workshops. Um, seed saving is a pretty big one that I do. I think seed saving and food preservation are two very, very important skills as we go into the future. I've maintained a seed exchange since um, probably 2003. I love sharing seeds with people. I think it's valuable to not commodify seeds. And uh, the picture on the top left is showing my mentor with seed saving, Forrest Shomer. Um, he is one of the only two men in that picture. Um, that picture shows all the people that came for the seed saving workshop. Each container has a different type of seed in it. And so each of those people went home with a small seed exchange that they could bring to their communities and continue to expand on. It's always been a joy to have people come from diverse areas in our bioregion, come together, share knowledge and leave with um, these gifts. Uh, it's also been a joy to travel to really beautiful and unique places. So the picture on the bottom right is showing the um, Big Bend Hot Springs Permaculture Course in 2011. Um, that was a really good event. And then also in 2011, since I had been building all this social capital, you know, I thought that the permaculture teachers really need to get together to talk about, you know, where's the movement going? How can we organize for resilience in our communities? How can we support each other? And so we hosted this two years in a row at the Wild Time Farm. And then around 2011, I started um, working at Bastyr University. And I think that's also the year that I started working at Oregon State University. I had done my permaculture course by correspondence before the internet was really a thing with April Sampson Kelly and Leisure Coast Permaculture Visions. And so that was uh, one reason why Andrew asked me to start teaching at Oregon State as we began developing one of the first online permaculture programs. And then the Bastyr University program was met on weekends and it was a certificate in holistic landscape design. And um, I worked on that with Dave Bainline. And as things were growing, you know, more people were hearing about what was going on. And so um, come 2013, um, the International Permaculture Convergence was meeting in Cuba. And I had had the good fortune to host Roberto Perez, who was in the um, movie, if you saw it, um, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. He was hosting the International Permaculture Convergence in Cuba, which happens every two years. And there's always a different location. This year it's happening in Argentina. And so Roberto, Roberto asked me to give a keynote and I was, supposed, I was talking about urban permaculture in Portland. So the picture on the top left is showing me and Andrew Millison, um, he gave a bit of a wrap before I did my presentation. And then the picture on the bottom right, we were on a panel um, on permaculture and climate change. And the man next to me is uh, Darren Doherty, who's one of the most prolific international permaculture teachers and is an inspiration. And then in around uh, 2011, I decided to move from Wild Time Farm and move to the city. Uh, people were saying, wow, that's really great that you could grow most of your own food, um, but I live on a city lot. And so I wanted to move to the city to show how you could trick out an urban lot permaculture style and be able to get you know meet most of your needs on that small of a space um when the uh land when it was determined that most city lots would be 5,000 square feet that number wasn't random that number came from what was expected the amount of space that people needed to be able to grow most of their own food and at that time I got together with Zane Ingersoll and he bought our house which was a pretty average house in Portland and we started uh, transforming the landscape. We made uh, we made both the local newspaper as well as the Willamette Weekly. And I got my doppelganger there on the bottom right. And that is not what a permaculture landscape looks like. Um, a permaculture landscape is not in rows. Um, we'll have some pictures coming up, but it was pretty fun to see that in the newspaper. And I also started volunteering with the Home Orchard Society and getting more involved in diverse varieties of fruit, heirloom orchards, and um, just really expanding my knowledge on all of these different wonderful fruits that we can grow that will produce exponentially and really provide a reliable food source for us. 
So that's what our house looked like when we first moved in. And here's what it looked like, you know, 10 years later. So, you know, in this picture, this is a very different front yard than the last one. Most people have grass in their front yard and that takes fuel often to mow it. Sometimes people use electric, um, but it doesn't really attract um, pollinators or provide for ecological functions. It's not really good at infiltrating stormwater even. And so our goal was to infiltrate all our stormwater on our site to provide for our needs, to provide for other species as well. And it was such a joy when my good friend from Marrowstone Island commented on the diversity of bird species in my backyard in this little oasis in Portland. When I moved to Portland, the nursery became a collaboration. I actually thought I wasn't gonna do a nursery and my dear friend Lillian Matlock wanted to start a nursery. So we decided to start Lil Starts Plant Nursery. And we did that for a couple of years together when we were selling at farmer's markets. And then eventually, because she was living in North Portland and I was in South Portland, we decided to split the business. And the nursery then became what we've been calling Mauritius Permaculture Plant Nursery. It was mostly a hobby. Um, the name is for lack of a better one, just because I wanted to just be able to have more time um, in the garden. And I was just growing so much diversity that it was really wonderful to share the surplus. Um, we had a, a vegetable starts CSA program. So our subscribers got one flat of vegetable starts every month. They would get exactly what they need to plant at the exact right time. Um, I was also started teaching the Grow Your Own Produce workshop series. So those kind of went hand in hand. And then we offered these other packages. The goal of offering um, the CSA program as well as the plant packages is that a lot of people want to grow food but they don't necessarily have the knowledge of what they need to plant when, um, what they want to grow. You know, many people want to grow plants to attract more pollinators, but they don't know what the plants are for attracting pollinators. So we paired this with the Grow Your Own Produce Workshop Series, which offers monthly advice on what to do now in the garden to optimize your yields. And, um, and it was a really nice thing that we had going on in Portland. Um, the picture on the bottom left shows how the garden would look in the springtime. I'd start just dividing my plants and then they'd line all the pathways. It could get kind of crowded. And then once it once April hit, we'd start having our plant sales on the driveway, which is the picture on the bottom right. And then uh, the picture on the top is showing the vegetable starts. I was saving seed for about 17 different varieties of tomatoes, probably 15 different varieties of peppers and lettuce and all sorts of different things. So I would provide my own saved seed when I could and then also other reliable varieties that were known to feed people. And the nursery just kept growing. So um, we'd have lots of people come over. We do tours of the landscape. Uh, people would you know, learn all sorts of different things about permaculture through this passive education, whether they were just walking by and visiting our chickens or whether they showed up for a plant sale and um, a garden tour. And Zane was an avid bicycle um, ad bicycle enthusiast. He was really into transportation by bike and avoiding using fossil fuels in the car. So it was really fun when we would take the bikes to the farmer's market to set up our booth. And so those are the pictures on the right side. And there's an aerial of our place. Uh, this is what it looked like. This was probably in um, 20... Uh, 2009, because the black um, patio cover, um, th that's a green roof. We had a 1400 square foot green roof. We had seven solar panels, which was mostly what we needed for our electricity needs. We didn't have a refrigerator. Um, we were using as little um, energy as we could, you know, just practicing, you know, how to have a minimal footprint and just have what we need. Um, the container on the um, right uh, middle right with the, um, it's circular and black. That's a biodigester. It's connected to a solar hot water panel on the roof. So we put compost and manure in there and it would emit gas, which would we could cook off of. We had an outdoor cook stove. Um, the benches on the black rectangle that's on the roof that um, eventually was a pergola, which was growing my wine grapes. I'm a winemaker and a cider maker. And then there's like a green mass to the north of the house. That's our water catchment. We had a 3000 gallon water catchment. We raised rabbits, ducks and chickens. Um, and we had 22 fruit trees on this lot as well as the nursery. And we were growing about 85% of our own food by 2020 when the pandemic hit. So I started teaching in 2014 at the Maya Mountain Research Farm in Belize. This is a really diverse group of people that I was teaching permaculture to. People came from all over the world. And it was wonderful to be just rooted within the um, 
Pechimaya community of Southern Belize, as well as the Garifuna communities. So throughout my whole development of my career, um, I feel like this diagram from Javin Brnikevich, who I work with at Oregon State, um, really says a lot of like, how do you how do you figure out where you're going? And so he would look at it like this bullseye where you think about like, what are your inherent gifts? What are your perennial passions? And what are your perceived problems? And that intersection where all of those come together is what he calls your native niches or your sweet spots. You know, I'm really good with growing plants. I love helping other people grow food. And that's one of my major perceived problems is, you know, I think that we need more um, energy that goes into producing food and um, local, local economies and um, for people to have these skills so that if something dramatic would happen in our lives as what happened to my grandparents, that we have some skills to help us move forward. Um, so this is um, something that we teach in the permaculture design program. And it was around uh, 2011 where I started teaching online through Oregon State University. Um, we offer a permaculture design course um, for, uh, each semester of the year. And then we also offer a permaculture design course pro, which is more involved for people who want to go into the practice of permaculture and consulting. We have about a thousand students per year through all of our programs at Oregon State. Um, this is my course that I developed. It's the permaculture food forest course. There's a self-paced version. That's the first part. And that's a lot of passive education. There's some homework, but you don't need to turn it in. Um, you can find some free videos if you want to check it out on my YouTube channel. And then the practicum is a 10-week um, instructor-led course where we walk students step-by-step -step through their design. And right now in the practicum, I have students from um, Hungary and from the Netherlands, as well as students from Cascadia and throughout the United States. So I just took these off of the OSU website. Here's just a little bit on the impact of permaculture. Um, it was founded in 78. There's been 44 years of practice. We find um, permaculture systems in over 100 countries. I would say it's over 300. I think there were 300 countries represented at the um, in our national permaculture convergence. Um, we've had 3,000 um, permaculture design certificate student designs. And then there was 45,000 pe 45, people in our massive online course. In addition to the permaculture design course, we offer an advanced permaculture course on climate resilience. And we also are offering a water management course. The Grow Your Own Produce Workshop Series has been going on for um, 10 years now. This will be the 10th year in 2023. Um, when it was originally offered at People's Food Co-op, and it was inspired by Plants and Planets that Rosie Finn and uh, Carol Trasado used to do here in Olympia at Traditions, I thought it was necessary to have a monthly time where people came together to talk about what to do each month in the garden. And now it's got about 90 people that take it per year. It's on Zoom, and I'm hoping next year that we can introduce hands-on workshops with it. My nursery has grown more than I can handle as my businesses have all grown in their own directions. And so we're working on turning the nursery into a bioregional producer cooperative. I think it's really important that we enhance biological diversity throughout Cascadia to stabilize our bioregion. And so this is why we're looking to form this, we are forming this producer cooperative um, with member um, producers that live in various hubs throughout Cascadia and will also be able to offer plants in the various hubs that they live in. We're gonna have a shared nursery list that we post on the website and then people will place orders online and let us know where they wanna pick it up. So this year we were doing um, delivery in white salmon in Portland and in Olympia and we hope to expand that for next year. Um, as I've been thinking about the need for hands-on education with all of the um, online courses that I've been teaching, I think it's really important that people come together in person to put their hands in the earth, to share food and to get connected um, with our place. And so it is my dear pleasure that I inherited um, Fertile Ground Community Center from um, Gail and Karen, that's uh, Gail Sullivan in the middle on the left and Karen Nelson on the right um, in the middle. Um, they managed Fertile Ground for 30 years and they just recently moved to Mexico last May. And so Susie Martins, who's on the right, and me and um, some others on our board are now going to carry on with their work of Fertile Ground Community Center as we change the mission to be focused not just on urban sustainability, but on bioregional sustainability. 
And one of the most important things that I think we need to be talking about is ecosystem restoration. So it was a joy to offer an ecosystem restoration course in June of 2022 with my mentor, Michael Polarski. And this was at Atlan Community in White Salmon. Um, we also just finished up a food forest workshop at, White, at Atlan Community in White Salmon. And I hope to be doing so much more of bringing people together to have conversations over our land and our food. And then I'd like to just remind everyone that money is not our only form of capital. Um, this was developed by Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landau, where they laid out the different types of capital that we might have. And so often we're focused on making money or um, how much money we have, but there's so many other things that are valuable and that bring value to our lives. I know that I feel um, so grateful for all the social capital that I've built over time and um, for oh, so many of these other types of capital. So I'm going to end with this quote from Bill Mollison. He says, the tragic reality is that very few sustainable systems are designed or applied by those who hold power. And the reason for this is obvious and simple. To let people arrange for their own food, energy, and shelter is to lose economic and political control over them. We should cease to look to power structures, hierarchical systems, or governments to help us, and instead devise ways to help ourselves. We lay waste to our lives in proportion to the way in which the systems we support lay waste to the environment. We need to expand the concept of social responsibility to include social and environmental responsibility and to create our own financial and employment strategies in those areas. We should not be passive workers for established destructive systems, but rather we can be investors in life. We cannot profess to teach one ethic and live another without damage to ourselves and to our common resources. So I hope that um, that serves as inspiration of, you know, caring for our place and with whatever your endeavors are. <laughs>